It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. Now you can live in Texas and not have a good red meat blend. Texas Cowboy Dust is designed for steak and other red meats. It's out to be my most popular spice blend, made with onions, peppers, ground mushrooms, pink salt, and other spices. Texas Cowboy Dust also goes great with chicken, pork, vegetables, and has a restaurant quality sheen to gravies and sauces. <laughs> It's like a loot machine. All around town, trying to get down. Vanilla smoked sea salt seasoning is for seafood. The tarragon and fennel bring out the natural sweetness in seafood. I also use it in rice dishes, on yams, asparagus, blueberry pancakes, and believe it or not, chocolate chip cookies. Vanilla smoked sea salt adds a salty and savory component to sweet dishes that create a symphony for the tongue. Sugar Chateau Desserts is a specialty bakery located in the Charlotte, North Carolina metro area. We will create delicious and one-of-a-kind treats for any occasion. Sugar Chateau is currently shipping cakes in a jar, offering a variety of different flavors in a single-serve container that can help you celebrate in accordance with social distancing. Place your orders today by calling 803-526-7895 or visiting SugarChateauDesserts.com. YT Productions. Yeah. I love my HBCU. Uh. And boy, I love it, love it. I love it, love it. Yeah. I love it, love it. Yeah. I love my HBCU and man, I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah, man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tune into the HBCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a loss. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, keep tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, yeah. he know what he be talking about. Talkin Mike about. and Charles, Talk. they know what they be talking about. Yeah. Talkin they about. compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, uh, yes sir, yes, and pay attention, boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. And you gon' learn today, you gon' learn today how your team they play, play they play, yeah. how they play, boy, you gon' learn today how your team they play, they play, they play, how they play, play, yeah. We represent that swag, that me and let me say, say, what's up to Tennessee, stay, stay, you tune into the HBC. This is Dr. Gaville with Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Mike is back out on assignment, so it's gonna be Charles and I holding you down today, so we're going to make you sure you get all your latest HBCU news. Yeah, we're kicking it off a little early today. We're just seeing if we can keep the lab lecturers on the toe. You know how the professor's prerogative. Sometimes he just comes in and starts lecturing. You just want to keep everybody lathered up and make sure they pay attention. No, we, we won't do this a lot, but sometimes we'll sneak around and get it in there. We might have to uh, dodge out of here a little early, so we want to see if we can get as much of the show in. And for obviously for those that are coming in, we're going to shout you out. And uh, for those that check, check it out, you can check it out on uh, Inside the HBC Sports Lab on Facebook. Go over there and um, check us out. As you're watching us now, you can go to YouTube and go back and catch what you don't catch uh, live there. So we're we going to get you make sure you get it all in. With that, welcome to episode 140 of the Inside the HBC Sports Lab radio show and podcast, the show that's covering the spate, the sporting HBCU dash for all things HBCU sports from institutions, large and small, from NAIA to the NCA. We share insights and information on the HBCU sports culture, HBCU athletic aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBCU athletic program in the business of HBCU sports. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, along with my co-host, Mike Watts and Charles Bishop. We're filming from our home studios and sending a signal live for Casey Wish 1230 
AM studios with the Texas Radio Hall of Famer, Ralph Cooper, in the beautiful home of Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. Today's episode of Inside HBC Sports Lab is sponsored by THG Agency, LLC. THG Agency is a company that provides sporting and educational consulting and data analytics. With that said, Professor Bishop, how are you doing today? Doing well, Dr. Bill. We got baseball. We got action. So, you know, I'm all into it. So. <laughs> I see that. You got a valley shirt on. I figured I wouldn't let you be, a, be alone. Prairie View is in the nightcap. So we're going to see if we can see what the Panthers see, what they ready to do. They jumped off and got it done uh, yesterday with a big win, 2-0 against Alcorn State. Jackson State did the same in their big win, pulling out the bats. And it seemed like they're doing it again in the winner's bracket. As they take on their rival, the only team in the SWAT that defeated them midweek yeah. game, Bramlin. A lot of people had some questions on that, even though it seemed like Bramlin may, uh, was stumbling at the end, losing the division title. Uh, but obviously, they bounced back with a big win day one. Uh, but um, struggling coming in this game early, close early. But now it seems like um, they're pulling apart uh, in terms of what's going on there. So go ahead, Charles. How's it going? You know, what's your thoughts on that? You got to no, yeah. I mean, I think the early uh, surprise, I think, is uh, Alabama State has been eliminated. Uh, Southern with a masterful performance uh, yesterday against Alabama State. Uh, they knocked them off three, three zip. And then Alcorn knocks off Alabama State today in the earlier uh, game. And uh, interesting stat from Charles Evan uh, at, uh, at the game. This was the first time Alcorn has knocked off Alabama State in 40 games. So, uh, that was huge. Uh, you got Alabama and m and Alabama State. They've already been eliminated. Oh, uh, yeah, that was wild when you talk about that. Seems like we got Professor Washington in the building. He's surprised. I guess he decided to get off the sideline. I thought he was on the side. And he's like, hold on, I got a report. I got to give you an update. Before I let him <laughs> give his update as we talked about, you know, the early round games of the tournament, I see he has his rally shirt on in terms of 1876 representing the Sports and Culture Podcast. Uh, give you an update in the seven. Check this out up in the MEAC, Norfolk State eight, FAMU two. I'll say that again Norfolk State eight, FAMU two. Bit of an upset growing in some people's eyes there. Maybe not in terms of Norfolk State being the number seed out of the Northern Division. A FAMU coming in with two seed after dropping four straight. To yeah. Lose the division title to North Carolina Central. North Carolina Central pulled out the bats and really uh, came out in their first game earlier today and pounded, if you would, Delaware State. So only four teams in the MEAC tournament. It be interesting as you start seeing that tournament move forward. Uh, but we'll keep you updated on what's going on there. Any thoughts on the Norfolk State FAMU or North Carolina Central as they're trying to do it in fine fashion? We tell and remind everybody they're dropping the program. So what's your thoughts on that, Charles? Yeah, it should be uh, really interesting. Norfolk State with an early uh, sort of a, a, a statement against Florida a and But if you remember back to 2019, Florida a and did come out of the loser's bracket to win the MEAC uh, tournament. So uh, you can't count the rattlers out, but definitely an early opening statement. Norfolk State on top of North, uh, Florida a and 8-2 uh, should be very interesting over there in the MEAC in terms of uh, uh, Norfolk State with those uh, arms that they have up there in the north. They won the the MEAC North five out of the past six years, and then North Carolina Central being the uh, story of the season over there in the MEAC with them playing their final uh, season. We'll see what they can get done here in the tournament. No doubt about it when you make that great point there. Let me go to Mike, see what his thoughts are. Uh, Prairie plays tonight. You see uh, giving them a little love, Mike. You see they jumped off and got it done. Big 2-0 victory. Played really well in their first round game. Very efficient, I would say, in terms of that victory. Uh, but um, it gets tough as you go deep in the tournament. Now you go to your second pitcher, second day rotation usually. <clears throat> uh, and we get to see really the quality of the arms down the team. But it'll be interesting to see what goes on as it looks like Graham, I mean, Jack State is going to pull it out and continue their uh, tirade through the fact in, uh, in terms of what they get it done. They're making statements all over the place. A lot of people's eyes is there to lose, and they certainly getting out the box really early in this tournament. What are your thoughts? Charles said the biggest surprise, Alabama State, in regards to um, losing uh, two straight, two in barbecue, as some people say. They're out of the tournament. What you say, Mike? Yeah, <clears throat> I would agree. And they lost to Southern. 
<laughs> Southern finished the season, I think it was like four and ten, five and ten. Uh, they didn't. They went. They didn't exactly finish on a on a hot streak. Now Southern does have a history of performing much better in the uh, tournament, but still, this is Alabama State. They went. They ended the season on an eight, nine, ten game winning streak. Besides Jackson State, they had the, the best winning streak at the end of the season. Their pitching was coming along. They started the year with pretty much a untraditional or uncharacteristic high ERA for a normally in de- very depth Alabama State pitching squad. They started to pick it up, and for them to lose like that, that was a shocker to me, to Southern. Not anything against Southern, folks. Don't take that, don't take that personal, but Southern finished third. <laughs> uh, their batting average is, is, is minimal at best, so even if they did perform – you know, well, I, I did not expect this. So, But you know what? That, Southern has that championship pedigree. Yeah. Uh, and they, they come into the tournament. I mean, I, I could I really didn't expect. They had a pitcher that came in on, on five yesterday, John Gotts, and he goes the distance. Now he's one in five getting that win over Alabama State, and he really had them off balance yesterday. Uh, the left with the off-speed stuff, they just really couldn't catch up to him all day. Uh, you know, that was a macho performance by Guy. So, uh, Southern, you know, pedigree, they, they've been here before. They had the defending swag champion. So, uh, you know, that, that was huge to get that win over Alabama State. He must have pulled out some serious pitches in his repertoire. Because <laughs> you said it yourself. I looked up the guy's record. He's like, I was like, where is he in the rotate? He's 0-5 until yesterday. So, yeah. I was like, uh, yeah. but kudos, kudos to Southern. Great point there, but then there's some statements about Alabama State where they have full strength for whatever reason in terms of the tournament. So we do got to make sure that we pay attention to that. Now, when you get on the field, um, we're not saying that that's the reason why you lost, but um, you got to come and play whatever you have. But not mentioning that does not provide a full picture of what took place in regards to Southern, as you're saying, their championship pedigree. Uh, but um, the the West is dominating the East. The East has the big, big dog, I guess you would say, if you would, a big tiger, big cat, however you want to talk about it. But just in general, in terms of the depth of the two divisions, at this point, it's really the West beating up on the East. They've won now four out of five in terms of this matchup. Now, it looks like Jackson State may be going to run rule Grambling, so they're going to get their second victory. So it'll go to four, two in terms of the West competing over the East. Um, but the big dog, Jack State, is making a statement in terms yeah, of. Jack, and what's surprising? Like they, surpri- they might run. Su- run. But go ahead, Mike. What's surprising about the Jackson State is I don't think we're seeing the best Jackson State. I think the lead batter, Ty Hill, who's leading the swag. And and batting average and slugging percentage, I think he's 0 and 2, 0 for 2 today. So uh, you, know, <laughs> you know what? I you know and to follow up on wow. your point, that was that I think the second biggest storyline is Jackson State getting a win over Texas Southern because uh, over the past three swag tournaments, you know they've been uh, they've been having to fight out of the losers bracket. So yeah. psychologically, that was huge getting over the Texas Southern hump. Because Texas yeah. Southern has been that roadblock in Jackson State's uh, way. They've come in with some pretty good. Uh, uh, baseball teams, but I tell you, Mike Robb has had uh, Coach Omar Johnson's number the past few tournaments. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Uh, let me give a shout out to a couple of folks following us out there. One of the Davis, Bama 205 in the lab. That's the uh, uh, Alpha brother there giving him a shout out, representing James Knox, Don Johnson, Ricky Burden in here again, um, Christopher White, Drone Sutton gave some shout out. Wanted to recognize uh, FAMU in terms of a uh, record type of season that they had in golf on the men's side, certainly no doubt about it. William E. Davis, uh, Frank Nelson, Texas Southern University. Hello, Doc Mike. What's going on? G.L. Barnes Jr. George Suggs is in the house, bringing it like he always does. Uh, William, uh, what I say, uh, Kari Arnold, K. Johnson is in the lab. Give him some shout, shout out to Kay. Shout out Stephen A. Miller. Yeah, so keep it coming, keep it coming. With that, we'll get ready for our interview shortly. Um, let's go to a quick break. This is Dr. Bill inside the HBCU Sports Lab, and we'll wrap it up, and we'll be ready for our interview on the second half 
and then we'll get back in some other talk in terms of what's going on around the HBCU sports scene. This is Dr. Gaville inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Stick with us. We'll be right back after this quick break. True Black Essentials is a retail opportunity to bring black businesses under one roof where every product on every shelf in every aisle will be black owned and black produced by people all over the world. Statistics show that the $1.3 trillion of spending power that we have as black people can easily be turned into each black person having $2 million if we were to shop black for two years. So True Black Essentials will launch an e-commerce store on November 1st, 2020, but we will open up brick and mortar stores in Atlanta, New Orleans, Charlotte, Houston, and Jacksonville with the very first store opening in Atlanta, June 19, 2021. How they play, boy, you gon' learn today How you take they play, play, they play, they play How they play, play, yeah We represent that swag, that me yag And let me say, say, what's up to Tennessee State, stay tune into that This is Dr. Bill with Inside HBC Sports Lab With Mike Washington and Charles Bishop We have our guest, Robert Clayton And I'm gonna let you let him tell you a little bit about himself But we're gonna get in and talk about sports analytics and we're going to show you how it ties into some HBCU framework. But more importantly, we want to make the connection with young people getting involved with analytics, data science. What does it mean from that perspective? I'm proud because of Mr. Robert Clayton and his pushing and suggesting and referencing, coalescing and all these kind of things, nudging, if you would, uh, saying, hey, man, what y'all doing with analytics? Where y'all going with analytics? And so we developed two classes at Texas Southern University. We actually have a double concentration in sports business as well as sports analytics. And I was invited on a panel on uh, behalf of Robert Clayton in regards to HBCU week to talk about sports analytics. But so before we go any further deep into that, tell everybody a little bit about yourself, Rob. All right. My name is Robert Clayton. I go by the nickname Bobby. Um, given to me by uh, my female friends, including my mother, back when I was a young man. Uh, grew up in Chocolate City, uh, old school guy, um, uh, right off of Georgia Avenue, right down the street from Howard. Um, mm. Yeah, I spent a lot of time um, on the hilltop. My father was a Howard graduate, and my mother went to Miners Teachers College back in the 30s, which is now the University of District of Columbia, DC teachers <laughs> to UDC. Um, so I've had a rich history, as all of us had, um, pre-integration or pre, you know, not segregation, right, um, of HBC world. Uh, I went to a prep school in Washington, D.C. called St. Albans, which is at the National Cathedral. I was a national ranked high school 880 runner, finished second in the nation in 1969 in the 880 and All-American, and then followed my brother's footsteps to Harvard. What's distinctive about my brother was he was the first African-American U.S. amateur chess champion back in wow. 1963, first world chess master. Uh, left Harvard in his sophomore year to become a professional chess player, to my mother's chagrin, but that's what he, that's, that was what he loved to do, and he did it extremely well. Mm -hmm. He was a graduate in 1955, which was the last um, segregated class at Dunbar High School. Uh, which you know is probably one of the finest public high schools ever created in the history of this country. I'm not saying black, I'm saying ever created in the history of this country where black folks with PhDs who did not teach at Howard or did not teach at Morgan taught at Dunbar High School. So they learned from PhDs um, who grew up in the neighborhoods with their parents um, and the elementary school and high school teachers that they uh, went to school with. So that was a very wonderful experience of having that legacy. I never doubted my own capacity because of some of my brother, you know, at the top of however you wanted to find meritocracy. Um, and so having said that, I go off to Harvard, I'm captain of the track team, I'm a world ranked uh, track runner and uh, best known because my roommate JB has done pretty well in your business. And as I tease people, he occasionally goes to a Super Bowl to show off Believe it or not, he was a six foot six, 170 pound forward. He was not a football player hmm. uh, at DeMatha High School, um, highly recruited, 
by virtually every high school and uh, college in the country. So I've had a rich background in sports, had a rich background in being raised by HBC parents down the street from um, the Mecca. And then I went off to law school and graduated from GW in 1976 and have enjoyed a 40 year career both practicing law and being in law school administration for nine years at Tulane University Law School from 86 to 95. I think one of the more interesting things about my, my background is just the wonderful clients and experiences I've had, and a lot of which have been based in the HBCU world. I've represented hosts of HBCUs and NCA compliance matters, several of which you're very familiar with. Um, I've represented um, Alabama State during the regime of the Cole brothers, <laughs> right? Talk to me about it, right? So I laugh every time I see what Deion Sanders does. I said, baby, you're reading out of the LC and JC's, uh, you know, playbook. I mean, <laughs> you know, they, they used to go online, man. And they, if you were a brother picked up for anything at any school, they would call you the next day and say, hey, you like a transfer? And, you know, you could you didn't have to um, sit out of here when you transferred, you know, from a, a D1 down to a, a D1A, right? So, you know, what Deion is doing now, LC and JC were doing big time. You know, they, they skedaddled out of Tennessee State, ran over to Alabama State for a touch. You know, like the posse was always behind them, right? <laughs> uh, well, I had to deal with that. I had to deal with their nonsense. But, I, you know, I, I tell people all the time, I said, the one thing you don't want to do is bullshit a bullshitter. And, you know, they, they bring that BS. I said, no, no, baby. <laughs> I grew up in DC. I ain't dealing with all that nonsense. Just tell me what went down so that we don't have to basically th throw the kitchen sink at you. Um, and at Tulane, I had a very interesting experience. I came into a law school that had 250 students graduate the previous May of 1986 with five African-Americans. And by the time I left that law school with a class of 300, 60% were African-American and Hispanic. I graduated over 200 graduates of HBCUs over that time. You know, people talk to me about, well, you know, I know HBCUs. How many campuses have you been on? Have you sat on the picnic benches of Tougaloo? You know, have you stayed at the Haight Hall when you go down, um, down to Tuskegee? Because until you go to the campus and, 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 you, and you hang with the life of the students and the faculty and the community, you really don't know an HBC. Each has their own, their own history. And I said, and, and the own history is on the campus. It's not in a book you necessarily read. It's not because somebody says it's a land grant college, you know, based upon the Agricultural College Act. No, it's actually going in and meeting the faculty, meeting the students, walking the campus is what I call it. I walked over 80 HBCU campuses because I got the best and brightest kids out of those HBCUs and there was nobody else on those campuses recruiting them. So I was able to sort of mine kids and work with professors and chairs of departments and had a great program and they, those kids are doing some great things now. And that really gave me an understanding of how important historically uh, these now 101, they were 130 at some point. There were 18 historically black law schools at some point. And a lot of people don't know that. I did a definitive history. It wasn't just four that we have now, Texas Southern and um, mm -hmm. North Carolina Central and uh, 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 Southern Baton Rouge and Howard. We always have done well educating ourselves no matter what the education was needed no matter what the profession was needed. And you just look at today, this is, the mission has stayed the same. You know, we still are categorically the finest producers of pharmacists, doctors, and lawyers, and engineers, and undergraduate with BA uh, degrees. There will be no comparable set of universities in this country that never will be. And so we have to continue to invest um, in that understanding uh, because that ultimately it's a village that has to be safe and it has to be productive. And that's been our historical mission creating safe learning environments for our children, wonderful teaching environments for our faculty. Uh, and then quite frankly, dominant um, athletic programs um, that have suffered from state appropriations not being uh, uh, there for us. Um, I just saw the settlement in the Ford and our state in Maryland. That's mm -hmm. 500 million. That, that's, not, that's a tip of the iceberg. You know, after 12 years of litigation, you have to, at some point, you got to grab the money and invest it. You can't be forever caught up into litigation. That's a no-win situation. And you can't have compromise litigation. Um, you may have integrated the schools in 1954. It doesn't mean we have integrated and productive schools now. So in terms of servicing African-Americans um, and their faculty and neighborhoods, 
And so, it, and, and I know Kenyatta, you and I have sort of spiritually been there. Um, we look at it from an intellectual point of view, but from an intellectual point of view, that's historic, but then taking the pragmatic side of what do we have to do collectively in order for us to maintain the superiority that we've always had. Now, one time I, I had a fourth year old, uh, fourth grader moved from New Orleans to uh, a pre Maryland and she went to a prep school, predominantly white prep school. And she came on one day and said, daddy, they always ask me, where am I from? Well, she's from New Orleans, but there's not really concerned about where she's from. They just want to know from a curiosity point of view, um, where you're from, not because they care that much. And I said, look, mm -hmm. next time, Rachel, they ask you, just say, I'm a child of middle passage. So she goes off to school about a week later, she comes back and said, daddy, that really worked. I said, what happened, Rachel? And her sister was in 10th grade. She said, you won't believe what Rachel said. This lady came up to her and said, uh, darling, you're very cute. Where are you from? She said, I'm a child of middle passage. And, and, she, said, and she said, daddy, that worked. They didn't ask me again forever <laughs> in that school where I was from. And I said, yes, because they understood when you said that, that you were confident and you have positive self-esteem and you weren't going to take any belittling or undermining by a question of where are you from? Okay, yeah. yeah, I am from someplace, but I'm a product of middle passage. And because we're a product of middle passage, we're a superior being. We have to, we have to understand that. You know, we, we not only survive middle passage by strong mind and body, but then we were bred. I mean, so, you know, at some point, it became a realization, particularly with, um, with the emancipation and the reconstruction period, that we can't let these folks elect their own kind, service their own kind, and educate their own kind because they're a threat to the very core of what we produced with our own labor. I mean, it's sort of an ironic situation when you create a country and then you're ostracized and then you're minimized, you know, through reconstruction realization of we can't let you vote. No, we can't let you have your own schools and your own states. No, and so, because at that point you're dominating the existence of this country. And that's always been a threatening uh, position. You know, one of the realities that we've all lived through is who are our role models? So I'm gonna ask you this. So when I grew up, someone said Paul Robeson, I said communist. It's like an association. It's like you associate black. It's not synonymous with excellence except on the NBA court, literally. So when a young man grows up and says, uh, if I'm black, what's synonymous with excellence? They said, well, the only place that black is synonymous with excellence is on an NBA court because then the white player is questioned regarding their competencies because they're white, right? But if you're black, your competencies are not questioned. Every other profession, every, every profession questions your competency just by the fact you're black. I've told folks one thing you need to do so that you don't get too caught up in the, the, the seven minutes of George Floyd, go to the lynching museum in Montgomery, Alabama. Mm. And when you go in, the first thing you see in bold letters are presumed guilty. Now, all of us grew up knowing we were presumed <clears throat> guilty, but none of us grew up with the next statement, presumed dangerous. See, I never walked around Washington, DC. I never went to Harvard thinking I was dangerous. Now, I, now I may be presumed guilty, but not dangerous. But then when you say you're presumed dangerous, it explains all of the catastrophic situations that you don't know are gonna happen to you, but will. You know, and because if I'm dangerous to you, I'm going to take certain actions that eliminate that threat. Now, guilty, I might take you to court. I might incarcerate you. I might decide that an orange suit is better than a blue suit for whatever reasons. <laughs> but if it presumes me dangerous, I got to kill you. I cannot let you walk around being dangerous, right? And so a lot of times we don't want to think of ourselves that way because of the neighborhoods we grew up in. I had parents that both were college graduates. I go to Harvard, GW, but I'm still dangerous because I don't, I don't define myself in that way to others. And that's, that's how I refer to others. And so as we sit here, and this is where we're the subject of the, of the conversation, it really becomes an issue of how do we continue to have our young men and women have the self-esteem that our grandparents had and our parents had because they were in villages that were safe. They were in villages, and I read that, I was reading, a, a, I'm a historian and there are two passions. And I've worked with the Smithsonian Institute um, on these two passions, Tuskegee Airmen and Negro Baseball Leagues. 
And the Negro Baseball League, because in an ultimate situation, we have a circumstance where the most qualified individuals are not allowed to play. And so I try to read every eight, uh, book on either individual players or on the leagues themselves to understand what it meant to be the most qualified in your profession, undeniably, undeniably. I mean, Satchel Page is a rookie at 42 and makes him two all-star teams <laughs> yeah. at 42. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, Jackie Robinson played one year for the Monarchs and was a utility infielder. Could never make an East West All Star game because Cool Papa Bell and the rest of the crew, he wasn't qualified. He yeah. was not a qualified baseball player. Yeah. And because he was not a qualified baseball player, then he became acceptable to the white major leagues because how could you allow the Homestead Graves or the Pittsburgh Crawfords by team come in and just take your game? So why don't we find an educated African-American who's not the best, but even with not the best, he still was a Hall of Famer, Yeah. right? And, and mm -hmm. so, you know, Cool Papa's, you know, talking about the one year with the Mon Monarchs and they're trying to get the man ready because they know they're going to bring in this educated guy they know they're not going to bring in the, the stars. They're not going to bring in double duty Radcliffe. They're not going to bring in Satchel. I mean, Josh Gibbs, I used to tease people, I said, you know, they're still trying to find baseballs in Detroit Park outside of the Wissip Stadium. I said, I mean, you know, now, now, if there's a baseball in the bush yeah. in Detroit Park, and you know what I'm talking about, that's a yeah. home run. Yeah. Now, now, you could say it was a home run hit by a Negro in black professional baseball, but that's a home run. You try to hit a ball outside of Griffith Stadium into the bushes of LaJoy Park, I don't care who you are, it's a home run. That's right. So you had the greatest baseball players who didn't, were, were not allowed. And one thing that uh, Papa Bell said about the whole um, concern he had, he said, look, you cannot allow me to do something. That's okay. That, that's what you decided to do as a society that segregate. But you can't tell me I'm not qualified. He said, that's the meaning. You can say, I'm not gonna allow you to do this, but you can't be telling me I'm not qualified. And that was his greatest frustration. It wasn't that he was gonna get the chance to play white major league baseball. It was the fact that they said they couldn't play because they weren't qualified. And that's, that's a careful distinction. I have really, and I, I tell you gentlemen this, I have really gotten away from giving the accolade to anybody that's the first African-American. And this is one of my more recent revelations. Here's what I will tell you. Mr. You Clay, I want to put, I want to put a pin I, on that. I, I, I know I'm running I wanna, out of you all no, time. This story, because you told me, and I think this is important for our listeners. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, then we're going to bring you back, finalize that story, and then we're going to get in to make sure that people know the sports down I hope I didn't use first. up my time unwisely. <laughs> no, no, you got plenty of time. We still got time. We're going to take this quick break, bring you back for about... 10, 15 minutes on the second half. Okay. Uh, we want to make sure you tell that story. And then we're going to go in and make sure they understand some stuff on sports analytics as well. Because you sown the history perfectly for the second half of this story. Stick with us. I know I'm off script, brothers, but this happens with me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're not off script. This is perfect. This is exactly what we need and what we want. I'm this watching the followers and they all into it. So you're giving them great information. This is Dr. Bill. Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. We'll be right back with Robert Clayton. He is the CEO and founder of the Sports Analytic Club program. Uh, we'll be right back. Stick with us after this quick break. Yeah. I love my HBCU. Uh. And boy. I love it, love it. Yeah. I love it, love it. Yeah. I love my HBCU and man. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. Man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I tune into the HBCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a loss. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouse. But if they won, keep tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. 
Dr. Cavill, yeah. he know what he be talking about. Talkin Mike about. and Charles, Talkin they know what they be talking about. Yeah. Talkin they about. compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, uh, yes sir, yes sir. And pay attention. You gon' learn today how they play, they play, they play, how they play, play, yeah. We represent that swag. That me yeah, and let me say, say, what's up to Tennessee, stay, stay, you tune into the agency and sports lab sports with lab. Dr. Bill, Bill. Mike and Charles. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Robert Clayton. He is the CEO and founder of the Sports Analytic Club program. Let me tell you the mission, and we're going to get right back to that story. And what you all don't know is I always tell you some of the things we say in that quick break off the mic is just fascinating. Sorry, we can't share that with you, but we're going to get into some things that we can share that are very good. Let me tell you the mission of this, because I think it's important, and it's really going to get to the crux of this analysis that you're in the story you're going to tell us, Robert, and I think it's important. That the Sports Analytic Club program mission is to advance STEM education in the United States and promote STEM-relevant professional careers for your young women and men driving sports as the educational platform. The Sports Analytic Club program's transformative learning environment is built on the interdisciplinary teamwork that excites mathematics, skills development by teaching the nuts and bolts, quote, end quote, of data analytics and by preparing students to communicate the data dashboard visualization to key stakeholders. That says a lot. Go ahead and tell that story of why you stopped using first to describe African Americans or Blacks when they are labeled as, quote unquote, this first to do something. Yeah, so we all get raised with a, an accolade when someone is the first African American to accomplish a particular opportunity presented in a white institutional structure. Doesn't mean that there weren't other African-Americans before that person who were equally qualified, if not superior. It's just that that one person was decided upon to be offered the, be offered the opportunity. And so I will not congratulate you. And I used to congratulate myself. I'm the first African-American dean in the history of Tulane University, founded in 1857. And now it's 1986. Oh, I'm the first African-American dean in the history of Tulane Law School. Well, I've stopped that. Because what that says is there weren't other African-Americans who could have held that position if given the opportunity. It minimizes our heritage by creating a situation where you designate a single person and separate them out as if there's something special within our race. We're not special. Mm. Okay? We are one of many. We are all products of middle passage. Don't forget that. All of us. So I decided that what I will do is compliment you for accepting the offer and the challenge of being the first African-American who's been allowed the opportunity to be introduced to this historically white structure. I will only compliment you on accepting the offer, mm. not for being first. Wow. And, and, and we, have to, we have to change that narrative. Yeah, narrative. We, have, we have to recognize that. That's very important. And that's why I purposely did not introduce you as quote unquote, being this first dean of Tulane. I knew it would come out in the story, but I wanted to we put a pause on that. Let me let Charles jump in here and ask a follow-up question as we take a deeper dive in what you were able to build in your experiences as you're telling the story. So fascinating for so many people in so many different ways. Before I do that and let you jump in and ask this question, I did want to give a shout out to Fan New Law School that has been brought back as we talked about uh, the law schools at HBCUs. We want to make sure they include it. We're not leaving anybody out on purpose in terms of that. We're going to take you, we're gonna take you out of Tallahassee, right? <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> so we, know, we know our homework. We make sure we get it out there. Go ahead, Charles. Sure. I, I, I wanted to take a look at uh, uh, the presentation, supporting data for, for Ben Wallace's uh, introduction into the Hall of Fame. And I was fascinated by the, uh, the comparative analysis that you did uh, with regards to his contemporaries in Dennis Rodman and, and, and Dikembe Mutombo. Uh, but then you go into the 70s. Uh, you, you, you talk about Wes Unsel and Nate Thurman, and then go back even further 
Uh, them little baby uh, from Paris. Yeah, they had them baby in their prayers. Right. So you know, let me let me give you this backdrop. So we have a structure, what we call a three tier trainer to trainer, and we have a collaborative relationship between professional sports data scientists from the NBA, NFL, and and uh, Major League Baseball to design the research project identify the statistical data that's associated with uh, valuation of players for draft and free agent signing, and even on the business side for ticket pricing, if you deal with business analytics. Um, and they design the research project, but what they do is they provide to the students the evolution of analytics in their sports so that they can make analyses that you couldn't have made 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And with using these analyses, you can, you can distinguish players that otherwise would not have been distinguishable if you just deal with their popularity. You say Matumbo, what do you think about finger wag? Right? You say Rodman, you think about, you know, rainbow haircut, right? <laughs> and, and so the reality of it is you think about Wallace, he's just an everyday guy. He is a coming from Virginia Union, a religiously, a religious base school, but also produced Charles Oakley and, mm. and, and, and English at the guard. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and he comes from a small town in Alabama. He gets recruited by Oakley to Virginia Union. It ain't Virginia State, it's not UVA, it's not VCU, right? Mm -hmm. and, and he does a workman's job. He's undrafted though, hey, undrafted. He's the first player to be elected to Naismith that was undrafted, undrafted. In, the in the modern era. Don't forget that, undrafted. HBCU guy, put yeah. the pin on. Virginia you Union, and, and then, and like I said, we're not, we're not talking about, you know, FAMU, we're not talking about John Merritt at TSU, we're not talking about Eldridge Dickey, you know, the greatest quarterback. I, look, I tell you right now, you know, you can't talk about the GOAT when you deny the opportunity for Eldridge Dickey to play that position. And, that, and that's all I'm going to say about history and how you have to understand who we are and what we deny the opportunity to do. Right. That's why I don't buy off on Tom Brady. No, nah, until Eldridge Dickey gets a chance to play, you will never be the GOAT in my world because he was not given the opportunity. Left and right-handed, Michael Vick and just as accurate and faster than you. So, yes, sir. Look, I, look I'm, I'm speaking the truth. So having said that, I had a situation where I had a young man who's a coach at a mid-major in D.C. who asked me, how do I, what's my trajectory on my career? You're, you're, you're in your late 30s. The one thing you don't have a trajectory with is recruiting young men who don't even speak the way you speak, right? That's for a younger man in the AAU play, right? Mm -hmm. So he says, well, how am I going to advance? So I said, let me, get you, let me have you have lunch with my friend Ed Tapscott, who I grew up with. And Ed was former CEO and president of Bobcats, one of the greatest executives in the NBA that people never exalt. He's probably the greatest executive in the NBA. And so Ed said simply, he walked in with his jazzy sweatsuit, said, said, when I see you the next time, you're going to be in a, a suit. You're going to have a laptop on the arm. You're going to become the data analytics expert for your, for your college team. And you will then be able to accelerate your career because data, now this is back in 2000, you know, when first club, 2017 in the spring. He's just coming off of not making the final four. So, Having said that, he says, you got to register for the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. You got to take a statistics course. Well, I'm, I'm always intellectually curious. I'd never heard of the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference, quite frankly. And I wasn't going to go back and take a stats course. I've been trying to avoid stat all my life. I'm a social relations major. Don't let my STEM stuff fool you. You know, I was hung around with a lot of engineers from Microsoft as a lobbyist. And I still like, you know, I'm like a parrot. If you tell me something, I'll learn about it. But don't ask me, how do I find an algorithm? You know, and don't ask me how I create a data visualization. Don't ask me how do I cleanse data, you know, build an intelligent dashboard. I can pair it that well. <laughs> I know how to build strategically collaboration. So I ended up going up to Sloan. I ended up meeting with Professor Shields. I ended up concluding that there were very few of us in data science, even in the sports industry. Got back together with Ed Tapscott and said, how we change this narrative? He said, we got to start younger. How young? At least high school to middle. What school? I'm just coincidentally across the street from Emerson Westside High with a state senator. And I said, do you realize one of the greatest basketball players, if not the greatest, to come out of Baltimore and Marvin Webster went to this high school across the street from you? And she said, who is Marvin Webster? Like, who is Marvin Webster? 
Your chief of staff went to Morgan State. Young man, do you know who Marvin Webster is? I don't know who Marvin Webster is. Oh, wait a minute. So, so I went across the street to the principal and said, I got, a, I got an idea for you. We got to get Marvin Webster recognized. And where we can get him into is the National Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame. He said, well, how are you going to do that? I've heard of him. Coach had never even heard of him. You can look at that seven-minute documentary. Kid says, who? You know, I'm, I'm on ESPN to five eyes. And kids are like, who is he? Right. So I said, well, look, we're going to use data analytics to promote his candidacy. Mm. He graduated back in 1972. We're now we're talking about 2017. Okay? He's been he's been out of he's been out of it for a while. And he's deceased. And so I went to Ed and said, can you design the research project using the advanced performance metrics that the NBA uses? And can you identify the players? For him to be compared to that are already in the Hall of Fame. This is September 1st. We start a club, 12 young men. And the teacher is a physics teacher who happens to be a football coach and baseball coach. So he demands attention. Like, I want you in this club, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to get Marvin Webster into the Hall of Fame. These kids knew nothing about data science. They didn't know data research. They didn't know data analysis. They didn't know how to build intelligent dashboards. They did not know how to identify and analyze algorithms. They didn't know how to do data visualizations. We taught them all that. So I got a recruited a professor from Morgan State, Mona Sharker. He hadn't even been to a basketball game. He says, I don't know anything about basketball, but I do know how to teach data science. Well, that's what I need. I don't need somebody getting up there, getting all enamored with the sport figure. I need you to teach these kids the fundamentals of data analysis and research. Wow. And so he did that, right? So the trainer, the professor taught the teacher who taught the students. Wow. So we, we roll along and we send a report to the Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame in Kansas City the first week of November, December. Well, at the same time, the city council person gets a hold of the Baltimore Sun and says, let's do a story on the first scholastics, you know, sports analytics club in the country. And it's in his district, right? And so the reporter calls me. He says, okay, we're gonna do a sports story. I said, what is it a sports story? This is an education story. I, I, you know, this isn't about Marvin Webster. This is about this educational experience that these students have to make them competitive in a digital economy. This is teaching them how to be data scientists. Mm -hmm. And so he said, well, you mean I gotta change the story? I said, yeah, let me tell you who you're gonna interview. You gonna interview Ben Shields at MIT Sloan. You're gonna interview Professor Sharker at Morgan State. You're gonna interview Ed Tapscott. You ain't gonna interview a single student because this is about STEM education. Absolutely. This is not about sports. Sports Absolutely. is the attraction. You know, the ability for these kids to do a sports data driven project is what attracts them to learn the skill set. Yeah. It's not the end product. The end product is for you, for you to become a data scientist, for you to get an advanced STEM degree at a major university. That's the goal. Okay. Wow. So, so now we're rolling along. We get a story that's all about Ben Shields and all about Robert Clayton and Ed Tapp. It ain't about the kids, it's about what they learn through this collaboration of professionals. Well, the first thing that people ask me, how did you get MIT to invest in the lowest ranking high school in the state? Zero math proficiency, student body of 920 students, 98% are black with a zero math proficiency. 70% free and reduced lunch. Those are the demographics we look up. I call them the wrong zip code schools. I bet, you know, people say, why you call them wrong zip code? Because they're in the wrong zip code for your investment. Okay, that's why I'm calling them. We're gonna, we're gonna define it the way it is. It's about your zip code. Let's not, let's, not, let's not BS around with people about what this is all about. So, report, reporter does a story. Oh yeah, that's pretty good. Then Marvin Webster gets elected to the Hall of Fame and announced in March of 2018. What was key, the chair of the Blue Ribbon Select Committee said the reason that he got elected was because this is the first time the voters had seen a data-driven analysis of a player. Wow. Compared to Earl Monroe, Walt <clears throat> Frey, wow. Bob, uh, Bob Parrish, and Willis Reed. So these are top, top, top players. The kids decided Earl Monroe. I mean, like, Earl Monroe? Look, the Pearl did some serious stuff at Winston-Salem State. I mean, he was like throwing down 40 when he didn't have three points, okay? He said, well, but if he was impactful on the offensive end, how about 20 points a game, 20 plus rebounds a game and eight block shots a game, ain't that impactful on the 
defensive side. And, and Tapscott said, yeah, let me tell you, if I have a kid to, 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 to draft right now that's 20, 20, and 8, I'm drafting that kid. <laughs> you throw in 40 for the three-point, I, I, I got shooters. But you're going to give me 20 rebounds a game? Yep. Eight block shots a game? And 20 points? Oh, you you number know one. Well, Webster went number three, okay? He was the first player drafted in the top three spots by the ABA and NBA, right? People don't, don't remember that because he's a 20, 20, and eight. That's serious numbers, okay? 20, you know, average 24 rebounds a game. That's serious stuff, man. You yeah. do 120 and people say, whoa, got 20 rebounds. You do 15, they're like, whoa. So he gets elected. Second story comes out. When the second story came out, it hit ESPN. I get a call three weeks later from the executive producer, Eddie McGee says, we'd like to do a documentary on these kids and their academic achievement. First time ESPN had ever done a story on the academic achievements of kids in sport as opposed to talent separation or hardship, right? So ESPN documentary, Defy the Odds, uh, eight minute documentary premieres the morning of his um, enshrinement. He's deceased at the time. That's a Sunday. By the time I got home on Monday, I'm like, my secretary said, do you work for the law firm or do you work for this concept? Because we don't have, we didn't have a, a nonprofit. I mean, it's like, it's just an idea, you know, that we could, we could do this. And so at that point, we incorporated and we started to build a national program. And so this fall, I launched 31 clubs, 14 states in the District of Columbia. I've got 36 university partners. I've got 37 data scientists from NBA, NFL, MLB, ESPN. I have a young lady from Tennis Australia, okay? Intelligence group for tennis, right? Recruited internationally because in the United States, we just don't have that in volleyball and tennis like they do internationally in these sports. And, and the beauty of it all is, is that the students are assigned a research project that has to have three important elements. It's gotta be fun for them. Uh, yeah, let's get Marvin Webster into the Hall of Fame, like sports, right? It's got to be complex. Oh, no, this isn't about rebounds. You know, it isn't about points scored. This is about advanced performance metrics used by the NBA today to make decisions about who to draft and who to sign a free agency. And then it's got to be actionable. And this is what's really critical about Marvin Webster, Ben Wallace, Charles Oakley, we're doing Kirk Flood at Baltimore yep. City College. We're doing Maury Wills at Crenshaw. But we're not doing Maury Flood. When you hear Flood, you hear reserve clause. Right. Litigation. Yeah. No. We start with the greatest defensive outfielder in the history of the game using analytics. <laughs> we talk about, you know, in his era, was one of the best hitters. And we do a scattergraph showing that he was one of the best hitters compared to other Hall of Famers and other right. players in his era. And right. then we come back. Let, let uh, Mike ask the follow-up oh. question. Because we got about five minutes before oh. we have to close it. But what we'll do is, with all the interest I see with everybody else, we're going to find a way to bring you back. We're going to make this the first time <laughs> that we have somebody do it. I mean, did I tell my story about the Sports Analytics Club okay for you all to understand? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah, we're still going to bring you back. If you can squirt, uh, put some time in next Tuesday, we want to bring you back to do the second part of this. But I want to let Mike jump in here and ask. Oh, Michael, I'm question. sorry I didn't allow you time to, to ask me a question. <laughs> That's all right. Doc, Doc does it to me all the time, so I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I just have one question. So I was looking at your data statistics, and they were two measurements that just blew my mind. One was value over replacement comparison, and the other one was win share. And value over replacement is an estimate of each player's overall contribution to the team compared to a theoretical replacement player. And then win share is a player statistic which attempts to divvy up credit for team success. This can not only be used for recruiting, trading in the NBA, but also probably salaries and here it is in black and white. How did you, I mean, where did this come okay, from? So, I've never seen okay, this. So now, this, it's interesting. This is I, phenomenal. I decided, because I, I can't, I can, 
I can BS a little bit about this STEM stuff, but I mean, I'm not, I can't memorize defensive box plus minus. I can't memorize warp and I can't memorize flinch yet because as much as I want to try, it's a technical evaluation. So Dan Rosenbaum, who's considered one of the top five data scientists in the NBA, came away and said, look, we're going to judge Marvin uh, Wallace on these three critical factors. And you pick them out. They're on pages 19, 18, and 17. Forget all the 17, yeah, 17 and 18. So, yeah, and then you also get to defense box plus minus. So he said, look, this is how we judge players today. And let's line him up against the comparables, right? Because this is, and when you line them up against the comparables, there's no comparison. I mean, the the performance by Wallace in comparison with the other five, four comparables, it, I mean, in those three of, of what we call advanced performance metrics, that's not yep. even, you look at that and say, wow, the other players aren't even close. And, and Matombo's a good finger wag, a defensive player. Rodman has got his chops, right? Zelmo and Unseal, but comparison in advanced performance metrics, and then you say, well, we can see why now he's a Hall of Famer, right? And see, this is what's critical. Young men and young men and women playing basketball. And this came out and uh, I was responding to somebody at LinkedIn and they said, oh, we need to figure out how to get jobs for the D1 basketball players because they don't have time to work jobs. I said, I tell you what, you tell every one of those players, you learn an analytics associated with your play. Why you're in practice and why you in game. You learn what it is defense box plus minus for your play and warp and wind share. And if you learn that, you'll become a data scientist just in the art of knowing how the analytics are evaluating you, but you aren't taking the time to learn the analytics that are making judgment about your play and where you're gonna be drafted, right? And so you could be learning that as you are practicing a player and playing and know better how to play effectively to get drafted. If you want to be number one, wow. learn the advanced and metrics that are being associated with choosing you number one and play mm. accordingly, right? Play wow. according to the analytics associated with your performance evaluation. Ain't nothing about 4.6. Ain't nothing about three point plays. It's about these three performance analytics advanced. And Rosemont said, we're going to do advanced. When he did advanced to Wallace, okay, what happened? He is the most dominant defensive player in the history of the game based upon advanced performance metrics. If you Stop, did, oh, we can put a pin right? on it right there. He is the most dominant. Say it again. He is the most dominant defensive player yes. in the history of basketball. And, gonna- and, and, and look, Mike, you pointed it out. If the folks could see the graphs, they say, well, wait a minute, this big graph up here and this one down here, that's, that's Wallace and that's Rodman? Oh, wait a minute. How did I ever think he was, how did I think Matumble was, I mean, the graphs speak for themselves. It's I'm, like- I'm going to put up one of those graphs. Like I'm the ball don't ball. lie, right? The ball don't lie. The graphs don't lie, right? It don't lie. <laughs> right? And I'm going to make sure they get to see one of those graphs because it's going to really do it for them. But this is what we're going to do. We're going to have to clump and close on the show. But if you can find time next Tuesday, we're going to bring you back and do the second part. Well, I, hope, I hope this has been enjoyable for you, gentlemen. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, it's <This> great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Mike, I, I like, look, Mike, you're like Dr. You're like Dr. Cavill. You, you, you went, I said, oh, look, I got my three pages right here. I said, oh, look. And Mike said, look, I looked at these pages. And here's the ones that really, you know, caught my eye. And I said, oh, Mike's my man. He, he just, he zoomed in on the three metrics that made this person a Hall of Famer. These were three metrics that voters had never seen. I tell you, how do you, they had never seen these metrics. He, he became elected to the Hall on pages 17, 18, and 19. Forget all that other stuff, right? You know, that's just comparison rebounds, rebound percentage by 100 possessions, all that. That's traditional stuff, right? It's these three pages. Mike, you on mute. Say it again. I said that page 17 and 18 says volumes. I mean, that right there. Well, okay. we're so out of, out of, out these of are high school kids doing this analysis. Okay. So where is my eighth, where's my 10th grade at Armstrong going to be when he comes up and he gets an interview and somebody says, do you know how to do analytics? He says, oh yeah, I can do advanced performance metrics. He said, well, you know how to program? I can do R Python, which one? And the next kid up says, I didn't even know I had to have Python. Look, my whole deal is 
I want my kids to be eight years ahead of the competition. I know something's going to catch up with nepotism and all the rest of the stuff, right? If I take us, and I'll leave you with this, I got Fulton Leadership Academy. I got 330 black men, grades six through 12, all of whom are going to be required to be proficient in R and Python programming next year with a major grant from Bechtel. All their STEM courses will be infused with data science case studies, and they will have an all-star group that is now doing Herschel Walker to pro football. Wow. Okay, so uh, having said that, here's how this plays. Eighth grader at Fulton Leadership Academy comes up for an interview at Deloitte when he's a sophomore in college. An interviewer says, do you know how to program? And he says, I do. R or Python, both. The other comes up for the same interview and says, do you know how to program? Well, yeah, uh, 0365 Excel, no. Can you do Python or uh -uh, no? Well, my kid is now eight years ahead of you. Now, that is what this is all about. It's not about, I don't, I don't believe in even. I'm a track guy. Even don't work, okay? <laughs> you gotta finish first by leading, not, not by on the starting line at the same time. I don't mind laughing people. I mean, so we gotta give our kids not an even start because you know we'll never be getting an even start. We got to give them an advantage so that they are always ahead based upon their preparation that we gave them as younger people so that they never have to face the situation where somebody says, well, all things being the same. Well, as I told one of my law students, you can never be a better white boy, so you better be the best black boy you can be. Okay. And I'll leave you with that because we have to convince our young men that they have to be ahead of the curve and not just bouncing some orange. You see, you gotta be ahead of the curve when somebody says, do you know analytics? Because it's an analytics driven world. Every decision is based upon data analytics, whether it's financial, right? Mm -hmm. or whether or not it's engineering or whether or not it's in sports or defense, right? That's it. And, and so gentlemen, I, I enjoyed being in your company. No, we enjoyed having you. We uh, Definitely. We want to say thank Pleasure. you for listening to Inside HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you share our podcast with your friends. I am Dr. Kenyatta Kaville, the Dean of HBC Sports, coming from inside the lab in the College of HBC Sports with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Hope you enjoyed our guest, Robert Clayton, uh, providing all the different information on sports analytics. We're going to have him back because you could tell he has a lot to say, and it's important. We're going to make sure that you get that information again. We want to thank you for listening to Dr. Bill's Inside HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop, every Tuesday and Thursday right here at 6 o'clock. Follow me next week as we discuss the latest in the news. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta from Bill, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, Inside HBC Sports Lab. Dream big and continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Charles? Of course. Mike? Lecture. Dismiss. Thank you. Yeah. I love my HBCU And boy I love it, love it I love it, love it I love my HBCU And man I hope my team they won one I hope my team they won one Yeah, man I hope my team they won one I hope my team they won one Yeah, I tune into the HBCU Sports Lab to see if my team wanna lose. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, keep tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, yeah. he know what he be talking about. Talkin Mike about. and Charles, Talk. they know what they be talking about. Talkin they about. compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna lose. Yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes, sir. and pay attention, because he gonna teach a lesson. Yes.